Hello everyone and welcome to another live edition here on my channel. I want to start by thanking everyone for your wonderful support. We've now reached, I believe, 11,000 subscribers, which is, has been amazing. It's been wonderful. So I'm very excited to share the knowledge. I have a very exciting presentation today. I'm going to be talking about Caravaggio's innovative techniques. I'm going to start by sharing some books as usual. I'm very, very adamant about sharing the sources the references. So that's important. That's something that I do here in the channel. It's a regular basis. That's something that it's really important to do because it's not opinion based demonstrations or knowledge that has been shared. A lot of the knowledge has been researched. So that's important for me to share with you guys. Before I uh, proceed with sharing the references, I want to start by thanking uh, a really good friend that sort of initiated this whole conversation about Caravaggio. His name is Cesar Cordova. I mentioned him before, and he's also a YouTuber with a wonderful channel, a lot of subscribers from Latin America and all over the world. So I want to acknowledge his you know, input in uh, this subject that is Caravaggio. I also want to thank my friend on Instagram, Eduardo La Francesca. He's also a painter and a conservator from Sicily, working in the island of Malta, where Caravaggio has spent the last years of his life. He shared a lot of PDFs with me over email and also some other excerpts from books. So thank you, Eduardo. I really appreciate the, the help with, uh, with this subject. I recently uh, purchased these books, and uh, these are amazing resources. This is Caravaggio's Works in Rome. This, um, these books I have listed in the description below. I've added these two books. Uh, there's three new books that I've added to the list. So this is a lot of the information that I'm sharing with you guys today comes from this uh, from these series of books. Um, these are amazing books. They have uh, technical analysis, they have conservation reports, and they have a, sort of a summary of the uh, painting technique that Caravaggio used. And they, what I love about these books is that they do individual case studies. They don't really simplify the technique as you know one general technique they're just going painting by painting explaining the grounds the pigments the specific techniques that Caravaggio would have used and this is important because I've mentioned before that every painting is a technical innovation and in a, in a work in itself it's really important to when you're sort of analyzing all master works it's important to take that into account you can't just simplify and put everything in one group you have to go, you know, on an on a individual basis, uh, painting by painting. And that's what I've sort of created a consensus here today with some of the knowledge that I'm going to be sharing. I just took a few paintings and focused on specific innovative techniques that Caravaggio developed. So that's important to, to take account of. I believe this is a second part. Um, there, it's called Caravaggio Works in Rome. And this is uh, this one's called Technique and Style, and the other one is called uh, Caravaggio Works in Rome, Technique and Styles as well. This one's, this one's called Entries, and this one is called Essays. So there's just, it's a, just a combination of technical studies, x-rays, you know, a lot of theory, just an amazing source of knowledge here. So I just want to share this information with you guys. And these books were referenced by Cesar Cordova. I want to give credit to him for uh, seeking out the books and uh, presenting in his channel the books. Another wonderful little book. This one's more diluted, but it has sort of a combination of essays, PDFs, and technical journals combined into one. And it's called Caravaggio's Painting Technique, Proceedings of the Charisma Workshop. So I want to start sharing this video with you guys. Um, let's just go ahead and take a look at that video. In this painting in particular, Boy with a Basket of Fruit from 1593, Caravaggio uses a double ground, and the first layer is, is coarsely ground, which is a standard practice for a lot of artists of the time. It's composed of red ochre, carbon black, lead white, earth pigments, feldspar, and calcite. And here you can also see the, the use of quartz. The quartz is a, it's a bit like a sand type like material. And that would have been almost as, you know, used as a filler, as I mentioned before, many, many occasions. 
and the, the mixture of earth pigments, lead white, which makes it lighter. And this is important because when you're working with a, you know, with a ground that, is, that has a lot of absorbency, it, it holds the paint better. And here you can see how, you know, this is still true to a lot of, you know, a lot of artists that are working with gray grounds and even dark grounds who are adding chalk to the grounds. That's important. That's an important uh, component. And he's using a finer, a finer uh, mixture of pigments, meaning that they're finely ground on the second layer. The composition is very similar. So most likely it was, you know, put um, back to back, uh, not allowed to dry. So that means that you apply one layer and then, you know, immediately you're, you're probably grinding the paint just slightly more and then grinding it with oil and you will have a finer, finely ground paint. So in the second layer, you have a finer ground and you have a double ground as a result. That results in a very, very smooth ground. And these paintings demonstrate that technique. It's, they're, you know, they're finely uh, executed. Uh, there's a lot of de detail and not a lot of impasto. So let's just go ahead and move on. This is important because when, you, when I analyzed this technique, which I was shocked, I mean, Here's a detail from Alta Definizione. This is a, a website that I've shared before and Cesar Cordova has shared before. There you can see the exposed ground, okay? And this ground, he would have started this painting. Now, scientists document the use of this ground in this books that I have uh, shared with you guys. And in this area, he leaves the ground completely exposed. Now, there's a lot of theories that Caravaggio used a grisaille and, you know, in some of the other paintings, and perhaps he did. But in this painting, it doesn't seem like that's the case. Uh, there's a gray ground, and he just works the flesh color directly over this gray ground. They don't find, you know, a lot of thick impostos. And he leaves that gray ground exposed in the edges between the still life and the flesh color. And the theory is that he uh, executed the still life first, and then later on, he applies the flesh. So that's that's important to, to know. And I, I did a, a digital recreation of this. So let's just go ahead and move on. Now, this painting is, is executed much like a fresco. It's painted in sections, meaning that he probably worked with some areas first and then allow them to dry. And then here we see the overlapping paint, meaning that he painted some elements of the still life first. And then he later on retouch on top and overlap the paint, meaning that he painted on top, um, you know, putting elements one on top of another. Now, this is something that, you know, a lot of artists from this time period would do. Uh, our fresco artists would do that, especially by working in fresco, and then they would do seco on top. So this is something that it's very common to fresco artists. So you could see that the, the red flesh color is right over the gray ground right there, composed of very thin velatura type layers. And this is important because when you're Working on this style, this is much more like a Flemish sort of style. And there you can see the ground coming through, the gray ground, uh, once again, coming through. This is something that he would later on exploit in his dark grounds. Created this uh, theoretical working sequence. You see, started with a gray canvas, okay? And from there, he, he did a charcoal underdrawing right over this gray, gray ground. Whether this was transferred or not, I cannot be certain of that. There's theories that Caravaggio used optics. I myself don't, don't think that's the case. I think that these are directly done from observation with a the model. Uh, there's a lot of evidence, I believe, in, in, in just in the way that, that his facility with the brush and the facility with the, you know, with, with the, the paint that Caravaggio was a very, very skilled draftsman. So I don't, I don't believe in the theories of the, the optics. I mean, I think they're probably exaggerated. Their, their use is exaggerated. Um, and, 
And, I, and the reason is because I have a camera obscura, I have a concave lens, I've experimented with all of these devices and it results in a very, very cumbersome way of working. Uh, you're sort of projecting this image and you get distortions and you know, it's, it's the optics were very, very archaic. So uh, I just don't, I don't believe that this was done with any, you know, perhaps a grid. It could be that he used a grid, put it, placed the grid in front, front of the model. After this, it's believed that Caravaggio painted the still life first. And how did, he, what, how did he achieve this? Well, he probably set up a still life on a table and painted the still life directly from observation once he had the model. And then once he completed that still life, then he moved on to the rest of the painting. So most likely brought in the model a second time or a third time or many for many uh, sessions. And then he would just work in combination with the model and the still life. Probably the, you know, you could just you could just tell in the hand that the hand is not really working uh, with the still life. It's, it's, it's almost like the hand is resting on a table. It's not really holding the still life. So that's probably the, the, you know, the case here. And it is um, theorized that in order to incorporate the still life with the figure, he overlapped the edges. For example, where the leaves overlaps the shoulder, he included that as an afterthought and some of the, the leaf the leaf that is actually overlapping on the sleeve, uh, that seems like it's an afterthought as well. And that's just to, to create more of a, uh, an integration between the figure and the still life. So that's the theory behind this painting. And it's not, it's not a lot of layers of paint. Uh, it seems like it's just a few, just you know, minimal layers of paint. So it's a pretty straightforward painting. Now, I've mentioned here before the use of an underpainting or under sketch in, in paint, and it doesn't seem like he did that in this painting. But again, we cannot be sure. Uh, I can't be sure. That's just a theory. So let's just go ahead and move on. Caravaggio is commissioned the calling of Saint Matthew and the martyrdom of Saint Matthew. Okay, these are probably the largest works that he had done up to date. And they were commissioned by Cardinal Del Monte. This painting has proved to be very, very challenging for Caravaggio. He was working with a space that was very dark, and the vaults were executed by his teacher, Giuseppe Cesari. And apparently Caravaggio contributed to these to, to the work in Cesari's workshop. And this is telling because it seems that Caravaggio employs some fresco techniques in working with some of these paintings. These are very large paintings. It seems that Caravaggio struggled initially with the, the martyrdom of St. Matthew. And this is the painting right here. As I study these paintings, the, the um, calling of St. Matthew made a lot of sense to me, but this painting seems strange. And I, you know, I, I looked at the space and I was um, you know, figuring out what was happening in terms of space. Um, there's a lot of interesting things about this painting. It seems that Caravaggio in 1599 is commissioned both paintings and he begins with this initial painting. And as you can see here, the x-rays that he is, you know, it's a straightforward painting. He just painted the, the elements. But as you go deeper in the x-rays, you find another composition. So it seems that Caravaggio painted two versions. It seems that the first version was probably closer to a mannerist style, wanting to fit in perhaps with uh, Cesari's work uh, from the vault above. And it seems that Caravaggio was not pleased with this painting. Now, he was commissioned these paintings in 1599, and the paintings were installed by the summer of 1600. So these two very large paintings, about 10 feet uh, by 10 feet, he executes both paintings in one year, which is very ambitious. Uh, I could not, I mean, fathom just having a full composition finished and perhaps even submitted for review uh, by the people that commissioned it. And perhaps they did not approve of it. Perhaps he didn't approve of it. But it seems that he goes back and he begins a new composition. He begins to, to 
to employ some innovations. And what are those innovations? So now before I go on about this painting, I want to tell you a little bit about the calling uh, of St. Matthew. Let's just go ahead and move on. So it seems that halfway through then starts executing the calling of St. Matthew. This, the calling of St. Matthew seems like a more straightforward painting. Um, this painting is very innovative because it feels like a genre scene, but it's yet, you know, a religious painting. And this style would follow, you know, many artists like such as Velasquez would take from this, this theme and from this new, new innovative style of working directly from life. So uh, what does this mean? Well, essentially you have a genre scene posed as a religious painting, almost in a theatrical setting. You have figures that are being posed on a, on a regular space and Caravaggio would have been working perhaps model by model, meaning that he would have had a model come in, perhaps lay in the initial composition and then he would have started modeling each figure individually. Uh, and this is important because, as you'll see, he is probably very difficult to, uh, you know, if you're working with one model, you, could, you probably couldn't have 10 models or five models posing at the same time. So most likely what he did is that he brought in, you know, a model, an individual model, and then would post it on the canvas perhaps even a sketch, and then he would start, once he had the composition figured out, he would start modeling each individual uh, figure. But working on a dark ground, now this painting has a dark ground, it has a brown, brown ochre ground, or perhaps raw umber ground mixed with other pigments. I covered that in the last live presentation. And he, you know, how do you, how do you go about working on these dark grounds and why work, on a dark ground. Well, um, there's two, two advantages of working on a dark ground. One of them is that you could essentially um, not be so dependent on line, on linear qualities. You could be more concerned with mass. And the mass is important because as we'll see, it creates a pattern of light and shade. And that pattern of light and shade lends itself to an abstract quality. Caravaggio creates an innovation here, and it's that he will take the individual figures and he will incise, he will make incisions. And these incisions are important because as you can see here, he's sort of marking where the placement of those figures are. If you have figures that are placed in a specific setting and you have a composition that figured out around that, then you probably want to fix those in place. So these incisions are theorized that are not really to mark the drawing. They're really just to mark the position of the model. And I, I think that's pretty accurate. I mean, when working with it, you could see that they're not, he's not laying out the whole entire drawing, uh, almost like a, you know, a, a trace drawing. He's just making a mark specifically in, you know, the figure that's right next to Christ. He has uh, marked some of the outlines of that figure, and the other figures are, have seemed to be painted directly on the canvas without any incisions. Now, there is a perspective construction in, in a circle right above the window, right next to the window. That seems to be a perspective construction. I did the research, and it does coincide with the vanishing point. Now, that will be covered in a, a future life. This is very extensive. For those of you that are interested in some of my courses on perspective, I have courses available. And I want to show you some of the, the in, in, incisions. I'm using here the uh, Alta Definizione, and I'm closing in on this painting. Again, you could log on to this amazing website. And there you can see the incision right on the surface. And indeed, they're right where the diagram from the book describes, and it, it doesn't seem that it's very accurate. It just seems like it's just a general um, marking just to you know, establish where the placement of the figure. And here, 
I define the placement of the head and it's below the placement of the hair. So that's, that was telling. I mean, it seems that he perhaps was concerned with the proportion of the figure. So he really needed to mark out where the head, you know, the proportion of the head, how, how big the head was gonna be in proportion to all the other figures. So he probably marked that out. And there you can see it. It's, you know, again, if you log on to Alta Definizione, do um, a search on Caravaggio, you could access these amazing images. This was originally shared by Cesar Cordova in his website, uh, or excuse me, on his channel. So there you could see the incisions on the windows as well. Now, I, I believe these are probably more decorative. So a lot of a lot of concepts, a lot of knowledge, guys. I uh, really appreciate the wonderful support. We have run this channel now for two years. And in those two years, I've seen pour of love. You know, a lot of you um, are logging on to Instagram. And by the way, if you, have, if you don't follow me on Instagram, Luis Borrero Art, I'm always posting different things there, um, you know, different content. And I just launched uh, a new website it's called Atelier School Online. This website has a course that has been recently released, a Vermeer, my Vermeer course. I want to invite everyone to check out uh, this new course that I just released. And if you're interested in a curriculum with one-on-one -on -one instruction, then you're probably more interested in my live courses. And those are going to be um, starting uh, now this coming week. Uh, for three, four weeks, we're gonna be working three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We're gonna be working from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. We're gonna be working uh, with drawing, painting, and figurative drawing. And again, I wanna thank you for your amazing support. So um, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, make sure to subscribe. And I will be back in two weeks time, perhaps three weeks time with another live presentation uh, focus on Caravaggio's techniques. All right, thank you for joining. Have a good one, guys. Hello, my name is Luis Borrero. I'm the founder of Atelier San Juan. This coming summer, I have a new workshop that I want to tell you about. It's a new intensive workshop dedicated to drawing and painting. During this workshop, students will have the opportunity to undertake drawing techniques such as light and shape, perspective, and still life drawing. For my painting course, students are going to learn basic color, they're going to learn basic painting techniques. We're going to be working with three projects. We're going to be working with light and shade and how to model form. We're also going to be copying a master painting, learning the different various techniques that the old masters would have used. By the end of these courses, students will have a portfolio for either college admissions or for self-improvement to later on develop their own work.